record. I know you want to record some of these in 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 new our house or whatever. Yes, uh, but probably not that. Basically, not next Monday, but the following Monday, I should be completely set up in Seattle. Like everything should be just ready to go. Even by awesome. Wednesday, I believe we can do the hangout maybe in our house if I can just get everything sort of organized. You know what I mean? Oh, good, totally. I, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here in our house. It's sweet. It's lovely. I'm excited. Um, all right, so we're now live with Casper stuff, so we can go into it. Okay. Who wants to go? So I uh, I have a like fairly massive update, so I think it probably makes sense for me to wait till the end. If that's cool. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right. I've got I've got a pretty lengthy update myself. So. Oh, cool. Uh, Michael, what about you? You want to go? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I I don't really have anything on the research side still. Um, working away at uh, implementation still and looking towards the the dot four release. We'll probably do a, a demo tomorrow at the dev stand up, Greg, and depending on how well it goes, maybe we'll do it on the community hangout as well. Okay. I mean, today is the dev stand up like at eight o'clock. No, I thought Kelly said that they moved it to tomorrow because today is a holiday in the US or something like that. Oh, okay. I won't be there if they put it at the same time. Um, let's see. What does my calendar tell me? My calendar tells me that it is at this time tomorrow. Oh, oh, okay. We could do that then. Sure, I can. I can be there. Um, do you, what? What are you guys working on right now um, in terms of implementation? Um, more R chain specific stuff. Uh, I've got Kent. The the one thing that is interesting is is Kent is thinking about how to handle um, equivocations. So if you get a block and that block is an equivocation but it doesn't um, break your fault tolerance threshold, then it's fine for you to accept it into your state. Um, but then I guess one of, the, one of the things we were thinking about is at what point does your threshold break? You know what I mean? So like, I guess, how, how do faults stack up? Is it that once I have a safe estimate on, um, one block or the other that's the equivocation then that's no longer a fault for me because i've decided which one i want and i bring my fault tolerance back down or is it that we don't accumulate faults at all and the only way for you to break your own fault tolerance threshold is for a single equivocation to be large enough to do it so that that won't work um because well it, so it won't work if you don't make kind of decisions explicitly so Imagine you don't pass the last finalized block to the uh, estimator to the fork choice. Um, in that case, if you show any number of equivocations to it, um, if it's greater than your fault tolerance threshold, you could have blocks that you detected were safe with the safety oracle actually end up being reverted. So to some degree, um, kind of the easiest thing to do is to look at equivocations until you see more than some number of equivocations uh, or until you're going to get an equivocation that essentially pushes you over your fault tolerance threshold, and then you essentially stop looking at equivocations. Um, and then we can pretty much, you know, easily say because of the safety proof, okay, you're never going to, uh, you know, make an inconsistent decision versus what you saw in the past using your safety oracle in your view. Um, so what, one of the things that I think is weird about that, right, is, is if we're accumulating faults for all time, right, because if I understand you correctly, that's what you're saying is that every yeah, time you yeah, see yeah. a fault, you yeah, use yeah. Yeah. Um, but we have validator rotation, then it seems weird that a, a fault that a validator did, you know, a million blocks ago and is no longer oh, totally, yeah. so like affecting you today. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, 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 um, yeah, so, 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 okay. So there's two things there. The first one is that, yeah, the question of how validator set rotation interacts with this is interesting. Um, and so the first thought is that like, okay, you only look at, you know, up to T faults for, for a validator set. Right. And then, you know, you essentially use that reasoning in a safety oracle. And so the idea here is that like, sure, we accumulate faults, but also, you know, we only accumulate faults per validator set. Right. Um, and so it's like, you know, 
if we rotate the validator set, it's like, fine, your faults kind of reset if the previous validator set finalizes. And that being said, you know, if a validator set in the past does equivocate, as long as they're still bonded, they should still be punished. Uh, and so this kind of gets into the second thing that I, I would want to say is that like, to some degree, you should look at equivocations. Uh, and the reason you should look at equivocations is because you actually have to slash people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. But so, I think there's a difference between noticing an equivocation and like pulling it into your state and like having it as part of your fork choice, you know? Yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Including it in your estimator versus just like, you know, showing other nodes that this person's evil and deleting their deposit are two different things. Um, but, but it seems like there's that, that presents an attack vector though. Right. Because, um, you, you could imagine um, malicious characters where they just uh, generate a bunch of faults. And if you have that many faults, then the whole thing stops. So, the, yeah, so, well, so ideally we wouldn't stop. So the, I guess the point here is that um, if they do generate a bunch of faults, given that it's weighted based on the number of tokens that they have, they can't like really Sybil attack, right? And if they do fault, if they are faulty, then, you know, then we're going to punish them. Um, and so this kind of gets to the idea. Sorry, what were you saying? No, no, but I, so I'm, I'm just, it, it seems like what you were saying, and maybe, maybe I just misheard you, is that once you pass the, the fault tolerance threshold, then you start looking at equivocations because nothing's safe anymore. Did I mishear that? Yeah, okay, so, so yeah. So this is the question that Vlad brings up of like um, um, automatic versus manual finality. And here's yeah. the idea. Like if we're gonna, if, if the next equivocation we look at, let's say we get an equivocation and if we look at it, if we like show it to ourselves, essentially, if we let it in the door, it's gonna push us over our threshold. We essentially have two options, right? The first option is to let it in and show it to the estimator and have the estimator handle that and essentially know, you know, know that, right? And, and kind of be prepared for too many equivocations and not revert for some reason somehow, right? Um, and, and one way to do this, for example, is to make the, uh, uh, make the estimator parametric in a last finalized block that you know, right? And so even if you show it more than some number of equivocations, you can't really get screwed on your own decisions because you're essentially saying, here is my last decision, be consistent with this by, you know, necessarily. The other option though, and this is kind of the easier one, is to not have the estimator handle um, more than two equivocations. So you don't make the estimator parametric in a last finalized block. And pretty much, if you're going to see more than T equivocations, you essentially ignore it. You essentially, and when I say ignore it, what I mean is you don't show it to your estimator. Um, you can still propagate it around. You can still slash this node for being evil, but essentially, you don't show it to your estimator. And so here's the point. You know, of course, if there are more than T equivocations, this can lead to a safety failure um, between you and some other nodes that have that same kind of fault tolerance threshold. But you know, that's the trade-off we make for making final decisions. Um, and, and it can totally. And so nodes, yes, can totally do this as an attack vector. But this is, you know, the fundamental thing with any consensus protocol that has decisions in it is, we, you know, we're going to face this. If nodes are faulty, we can we can essentially make. If nodes equivocate, we can make inconsistent decisions. That's just how it is, right? Um, and we punish them for that to try and get them to not do it, pretty much. Okay, I I, I understand. I, it, it's it was a slightly more subtle uh, answer than I was uh, uh, than I was hearing. Okay, so that, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, cool. So, so that makes sense to me now. The the part that that was weirding me out before was the accumulating. Yeah, totally. Uh, I totally hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it seems like it's it's especially weird if we don't rotate validator sets. You can imagine, like, you know, we run the blockchain and, like, you know, over time they disequivocate because you know whatever bugs, and then like you know, we're screwed. So, I, yeah, I totally hear you. Um, the idea is that eventually you make final decisions, and if it's per validator set, it's like you know not so horrible. Yeah, cool. Sounds good. So, so that that's that's the implementation part that hopefully Kent will be tackling this week slash next week. Cool. And that, that's about it for me. If you guys want to do your, your lengthy updates. Um, Nate, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So there's a bunch of things. I'm going to try and make sure I remember all of them. I was expecting Vlad to be here. So that's my excuse at least. Um, so uh, Vlad and I spent uh, pretty much all of last week um, talking to some developers uh, um, that essentially are going to be implementing some portion of Casper uh, in Rust, um, which is pretty exciting. They're essentially going to be, as a, like a first thing, they're essentially going to be implementing a core library um, you know, that you could plug into various things if you wanted to. 
um, in Rust of like, you know, CBC Casper for a blockchain. So Casper the Friendly Ghost pretty much. Um, including like, you know, the various engineering improvements, et cetera, et cetera, that are needed. Um, it was a super great week. It was, it was cool. It was uh, kind of great to meet with them. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're starting work and, and, and probably they'll be coming to some Casper standups in the future, um, which would be cool. Um, who okay, who this, are these developers? I mean, there are, so there's some kind of like uh, development team, uh, super, super cool, super legit guys uh, based out of Switzerland. Um, so Vlad and I were in. Oh, okay. I mean, are they part of the Ethereum Foundation? No, no, it's an, it's, a, it's an independent group. Um, it's an independent group of developers. It's like a, they're, they're, uh, they're essentially literally, a, a, you know, con consultants, essentially, you know, independent developers, I guess I'll say. I see. How are they being funded? Um, I believe Vlad currently, but I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know the specifics. Okay, cool. Um, Cool. So that was the, that was the first thing. So, uh, the second thing that came out of that was, um, Vlad and I, and also, um, other people too, kind of, uh, uh, talked a bunch about handling non-determinism. So for example, what happens if there's a tie in the blockchain estimator, how do you handle that? And so there's essentially been a refactor of the, um, like type definitions, uh, sorry, types of the estimator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so like, you know, in the abstract CBC framework, how we think about all these things has been refactored to some degree um, um, to handle non-determinism. And the general idea, I guess, to summarize it, I think it might make the most sense to kind of wait until Vlad's back so he can present a paper because he's kind of typed this all up in like this really abstract way that's um, it's, it's kind of coming together. But uh, I think the best way to um, summarize it is essentially say the estimator previously mapped protocol states to values of the consensus. And now instead we think, we think about the estimator mapping protocol states to subsets of the values of consensus, right? And the, the idea here is like, okay, if two blockchains have the same weight, then you can return both of those blockchains in the estimator. Um, and then a message that you make, any message that you make essentially has to make a decision on one of them, right? Um, and so the idea is that, uh, and, and with that, there comes a way to like refactor the other things, re, kind of refactor the safety definition a bit and kind of talk about um, safe propositions on protocol states, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, in a kind of pretty clean and, and abstract way that's uh, pretty nice and ha handles non-determinism nicely, which is uh, something that, you know, the framework didn't do before. Um, so yeah, sorry. Kind of vague, but uh, I think it's probably best to wait till uh, Vlad's back next week to talk about it uh, more in detail. Um, and the last thing is I have like a very first initial draft of the sharding framework um, that I mentioned last week um, that I'd love to share with you guys real quickly. Um, cool. Uh, give me a sec. Let me get it up and then share screen. All right. How do I? How do I share screen here? So you have to let uh, Christian will have to give you permission. Or no, you should be able to do it. Uh, I don't know. Green button. Green button on the bottom. Oh, geez. How did I miss that? My God. That's horrible. <laughs> okay. So uh, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, um, rather than to specify, so, so the goal here is to specify a sharding uh, solution that essentially uses queues to allow different shards to pass messages to each other. Um, in a way, essentially, the only requirement is that it has to be, uh, you know, atomic in that if someone sends it, someone receives it. And if someone receives it, then someone sent it, right? And um, that's kind of the goal of the, uh, you know, what we're, what we're trying to enforce. But kind of to do that, first things first is like we set up a framework that allows us, hopefully in the future, will allow us to specify other sharding solutions that we come up with. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's a first draft and also it's the first spec I've ever written. So if there's any super weird notational things, you know, just like, uh, you know, you know, bear with me, but uh, here we go. All right, so essentially we have some set of shard IDs. Um, and then we talk about the blocks in the sharded blockchain. Um, and essentially every single block is like, you know, a previous block or gen it's either Genesis and something or a different block and something. Um, where this something, W of X, is essentially tuples of blocks from other shards. And when we essentially call these the watched blocks. So essentially the idea here is that every single shard, every single block watches a bunch of other blocks from other shards. Um, and essentially points to them and says, this is what I see on the other shard. This is what I see on the other shard. Um, 
And now essentially what we're going to do, and, and so um, what we're going to do is we're going to restrict, sorry, there's some drilling going on nearby. We're going to restrict the blocks to like only valid ones that fulfill certain validity conditions. And then we're going to be able to use this to kind of construct our queues and allow for message passing. So um, the first thing we have is some like helper functions. This essentially says what shard a block is on. So if we refer to a block as B underscore X, that means it's on shard X. Um, we have a previous block resolver. Uh, the thing here to note is that um, uh, every single block is only on one shard. So this is unlike Vlad's previous sharding solution where blocks were on multiple shards. Um, in that every single block is only on one shard and then it also just watches blocks on uh, different shards. And then we have essentially uh, the watch block resolver. And the watch block resolver essentially, it takes a block and it takes a shard ID and it essentially returns a, a different block. And the idea here is that, um, you know, if some block is, if a block is watching another shard's blocks, then you can get whatever block that it's watching. Um, so you can see, essentially, this allows you to see what other, what other shards are watching. Um, sorry. Whatever, what blocks are watching on other shards, I should say. OK, cool. Uh, any questions so far? Go for it, today. Cool, thanks. OK, cool. Uh, blockchain membership is defined as usual, which is like, you know, it's in the history. They're either equal or it's you know in the previous block. Um, so it's defined as it usually is. We have a nice helper function that pretty much just says, like, here are all the shards that some block is watching. Um, so for any block, it's, it has, you know, some tuple of, uh, blocks from other shards and then, you know, the watch shards is where those blocks are from essentially. Um, and now, okay. So now here's where we get to maybe some more interesting stuff. Cause that was all kind of like preliminary stupid stuff. Okay. So here's what we do. We essentially define a transaction sending relationship, um, that I'm calling like arrow underscore T, um, where it essentially means X can send, this essentially means X can send transactions to Y. And then using this sending transaction relationship, we can define a relation W, which is essentially the symmetric closure of, of the transactions ending uh, T. And the idea here is essentially that this is the watching relation. And so here's the idea. If a shard can send, if a sh another shard can send a shard transactions, then they have to watch each other. Um, and it's both ways. And the both way watching is the only way that we can enforce the atomicity, uh, which is the goal in the first place, right? And so now we insist that blocks are valid in a certain way in that if, you know, the watching relation says you should be watching another shard, then you better be watching that other shard. So for any block on a shard, if it's supposed to be watching something else, then it actually better be watching that other thing. Um, yeah. And now I'm, I'm starting to show how it's a framework, I guess, by defining a consistency relation for watch blocks, which in the most simple case is essentially... Uh, blockchain membership. In the future, we're going to redefine this to make it kind of a bit more specific to the sharding solution we're specifying. But uh, um, for now, it's essentially blockchain membership. And so here's the idea. So now, and now, now we're kind of getting to where we're starting to talk about atomicity. Um, and you'll see maybe how that's related. So what we're going to say is that blocks are valid if they're either the genesis or uh, so here's maybe where it's getting interesting. So a block is valid if it's genesis or the previous block, um, uh, the previous block that it is watching on another shard. So this this says here is it's you know this is the watch block resolver. So the previous block that you're watching on shard Y must be consistent with the block that you are watching on shard Y. So essentially, that says if you are watching a block on shard Y, your previous block also has to be watching a a, a, a block on shard Y, and they have to be consistent with each other. Where consistent is defined as blockchain membership. So um, you can only watch things that are, you know, uh, later than your, uh, your previous block was watching. Does that make sense? Uh, can, we, can we pause here for? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so you said the, the watch relation is symmetric. So if I, if shard X is watching shard Y, then shard Y is watching shard X. Yep. Um, so what we, we talked a little bit about this kind of thing in our chain, um, more with regards to security, um, right. Cause if another shard uh, 
does some invalid thing and then tries to push it off onto your shard, that, that would be bad. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we were worried about is if every shard has to watch every other shard, then you don't really have a sharding solution, right? Because then the entire network still has to be on every machine. Yeah, totally. So the distinction here is that I'm not actually insisting it's like a transitive thing, and I'm just insisting it's symmetric. And so you can imagine that, like, you know, X watches Y and Y watches Z, um, um, and, and Y watches X and Y watches Z, but X does not watch Z. Um, okay, I see. So, so the idea is that this is a sparsely connected um, set of shards where you can only sort of interact with a couple in order to, or, or at least directly only interact with a couple in order to keep it uh, scalable, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you can okay. imagine, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. You only can interact with a couple and then, you know, we can pass messages through your cousin's brother's father, right, or something. Cool. Yeah. Got it. <clears throat> um, cool. Um, and now we essentially have enough to, uh, we can talk about what it means to um, have a sharded fork choice rule. Um, and it's, you know, ex it's essentially exactly what the sharded fork choice rule is in the other sharding solution, it essentially maps a set of blocks to, um, to, to, uh, a function that maps shards to a specific block on each shard. So does what you'd expect for a sharded fork choice rule. And the idea behind the fork choices consistency is essentially the following. For any two shards that are, for any shards such that X is watching Y, it should be the case that whatever the fork choice of X is watching on shard Y should be consistent with the fork choice of Y. And so the idea here is that um, we essentially are insisting in the fork choice that if if uh, what the tip of a chain is, if the tip of a shard is watching something on a different shard that isn't in the fork choice of the shard, then that essentially has to be orphaned. And you can kind of begin to see how we're going to start talking about enforcing these consistency conditions, because essentially we're requiring shards to orphan blocks if the fork choice on the other shard, um, if the block that they're watching, so sorry, we require block, we require shard X to orphan blocks if shard Y orphans the blocks that shard X is watching. Does that make sense? It's kind of a, a, a bit of a kind of crazy one, but uh, I hope it makes a, a bit of sense at least. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that makes sense. And, and it's only eventually consistent, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, you, can imagine, you can imagine if we have uh, validators on subsets of the sharding solution, kind of over time, you know, they, they, everyone does this to their neighbors and essentially over time, what needs to get orphaned gets orphaned and what doesn't essentially stays around and keeps getting built on. Um, so what's interesting is that without even talking about queues at all, um, or talking about the specifics of the sharding solution, um, like how messages actually get passed in the first place. And just talking about this watching block relation, we actually have enough structure to talk about load balancing already. And here load balancing, what I'm referring to is essentially we have some relation W that decides what shards have to watch what other shards. And ideally, we'd like it to be dynamic. Realistically, we'd actually like you know, this to be dynamic, right? A, a is sending to B, and B is sending to C. And maybe at one point, we want A to send to C directly. And so ideally, we'd be able to modify that. Um, I won't go super into depth here, because it's like maybe not so interesting. And also, to be honest, not totally finished. But the general idea is that we have to be careful that transactions don't get stuck. So imagine if shard A is sending to shard B, and then shard B just cancels their link. Imagine if shard B had the ability to say, screw you, I don't want to receive any more transactions from you. Well, it's possible that A was in the process of sending transactions that B hadn't seen yet. And so these transactions are essentially stuck in limbo. Um, the solution, and I'll just give the intuition rather than going too much into it, because it's like you know pretty straightforward and not super interesting. Essentially, it works very much like validator set rotation. But the idea is that if we're removing a link, the sender has to remove it. And if we're adding a link, the receiver has to add it. And essentially, this is enough to kind of say, OK, well, you know, transactions won't get stuck in this weird limbo where someone's sending it and the receiver isn't getting it, um, even though we expect them to. Um, the only reason I bring this up now is because it's essentially interesting is that we can do this in the general framework, and we don't have to specify a load balancing thing for every single charting solution we could come up with, which is kind of cool. OK, so now we have enough to kind of actually define a sharding solution. And so here's what we do. We add, we add to the blocks to essentially have 
you know, extra data to support whatever type of message passing we want. Um, optionally, we can redefine the consistency relation to be more optimized. Um, this is kind of like, you know, dumb and like complicated and maybe not so smart to do in a first version, but it was kind of fun. And then also we might need to find some extra validity conditions. So um, here's what we do. Um, by the way, I just recompiled this and I haven't actually looked at the latex. So if there's anything super weird below here, you know, you've been warned. So essentially, uh, we recreate blocks with queues, essentially blocks with queues. And essentially what they are is they're blocks. And we also add on to them. This is called outgoing queues. Um, so uh, a block with a queue is a block uh, and a queue for every shard such that it sends to that shard. So um, if this shard sends to another shard, it has an outgoing queue for that shard. And then it also has an incoming transaction list, essentially, or message list. Um, and this essentially, for every shard that sends to it, it has to keep track of what it's been sent, pretty much. So a block places it's sending to and places it's receiving from. And I'm just using you know lists of transactions, pretty much. The front of the queue is the front of the list, by the way. You know, we have some helper functions. This gets the outgoing queue. It takes a block and it takes a specific shard and it returns, you know, the list of the the list of uh, essentially the queue that's going to that shard. We have an incoming we have an incoming message list getter. Oh shit! This should be oh, shoot. Sorry, this should be uh, parametric in S two. I'm just realizing, um, and essentially gets the incoming transaction list. So yeah, this is a mistake here. In should be B Q cross S to T. A list to T. <clears throat> Then also we define the prefix relation for queues, which is essentially just the prefix relation on lists um, pretty straightforwardly. Because all we want to do here is now essentially we're doing the second thing where we, so first we've added stuff to the blocks to allow us to have queues. Now we're in the process of redefining um, you know, sim w or whatever, this consistency relation. And so essentially we say blocks are consistent if one is in the blockchain or the other, or they're on the same shard, and the outgoing queue is a prefix of the other block's outgoing queue for every shard, for everything that it's sending to. And the incoming queue is a prefix of the, sorry, the incoming list is a prefix of the inco uh, incoming list for every shard that it's receiving from. And so essentially, all this does is it lets you imagine here, imagine the following situation. Imagine there's a fork in the chain. Um, and right before the fork, a message is sent. Um, and after the fork, uh, some shard that's watching this sees one thing. And then later, it, it, it uh, realizes that that's not actually a fork choice and that the other side of the fork is the fork choice. Ideally, we don't want to have to orphan this every time just because it's not the same fork choice. Because you can imagine if no mess messages are sent or received during that fork time, it's not actually a big deal if we just you know, switch over and we, and we don't actually orphan blocks on the other shard. And so essentially what this allows us to do is it allows us to enforce atomicity um, without orphaning blocks if we don't have to, um, if that makes sense. It does make things a bit more complicated, but uh, you know maybe it's worth it. OK, cool. Uh, any questions on this? Cool. We'll have to take some time to like parse it, but I think it makes sense. I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I still believe if you go ahead and put in computational agency, this becomes a lot easier. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I totally believe you. Um, you know, my this is a, a definitely a first version. And like, you know, the, the one thing I'd say, I, I, you know, after all of this, just wait till we get to the end, it gets like dumb complicated. Um, and so this, this can definitely be simplified a lot. Um, but it's interesting, I think, nonetheless. Um, so I, I'm going to, I guess I'll. I'm just worried it gets a bit kind of crazy towards the end. So, uh, I mean, these these conditions are like totally absurd. Um, but so so essentially, I'd, I'm just gonna like talk through them rather than totally reading the notation. Um, yeah. yeah, just so we can uh, just so keep it brief because I've been talking for a while now. But pretty much, uh, the strip prefix function essentially takes two lists and deletes the first list from the start of the second list. Um, so it drops the prefix. If it's nothing there, it just returns the second list. Um, now, uh, now we define some message validity conditions. This first message validity condition pretty much says um, the incoming messages that you've seen must be the incoming messages that you've seen in your previous block, 
plus uh, the uh, plus the new messages that you've seen. So pretty much what this does is it says if you see messages, you have to have admit you have to admit that you see messages. Makes sense. This one is a queue clearing condition, which pretty much says if you see that someone else includes your messages, then you must remove those messages from your queue. Um, and so you know. This says you have to include them, and this says after they're included, you have to remove them from your queue. Then what we essentially do is we allow people to only take the first T transactions, or you know, where T maybe is measured in, or sorry, first T messages, where T maybe is measured in, uh, you know, number of bytes in message, or maybe it's measured in you know amount of gas. But essentially, this says okay, you don't actually have to uh, clear the entire queue. Uh, because that only works if your blocks are big enough, but instead you only have to clue, you know, clear some amount of the queue if you can. And so we redefine the validity conditions where you're including as many as you can up to T. And then we also say, okay, and this is the validity condition that says also you're clearing as much as they included, not all of it. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing we do is we can also insist that the, uh, that's some weird stuff. We can also insist that the, uh, queues are limited in size as well. And so now if you try and send a message and you know there's not enough space in the queue for you to send a message, then sorry, your message isn't going to be sent. Um, and you know, in Ethereum, we might have a throw or something. So yeah. yeah so that, I, that's, a, that's a kind of synchrony assumption, right? Um, so queue limitation. So are you saying that the other side is now blocked? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is all from a one side perspective. So, so this means that if I try and send, you know, no, yeah, yeah, great question, great question. So, so what I mean to say is that um, if shard X tries to put something in its queue when its queue already has N messages in it, then that is going to fail. Essentially, we limit the size of queues. Um, um, so, you know. I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, so it doesn't require, it's not a synchrony assumption that it doesn't require the other shard to see anything about it. It's something that one shard can do in its own right. right? Okay, yeah, that, that was the... Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. 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 Cool. And uh, that's pretty much it. What's interesting about this is that, uh, and and the goal, I guess, of like the framework thing is, although it's very complicated, the goal is to simplify. I mean, these validity conditions are kind of nonsense to some degree. Um, but the goal essentially is to simplify to the point that um, it's reasonable and understandable, and also we can specify different ways of uh, of um, passing messages cross shard. So in this case, we have queues. But imagine if we just had kind of like you know a set of messages that had to be processed eventually, um, you know, within a thousand blocks or something like that. And you know, we tagged messages with the block that they entered the set. And if the, you know, after a thousand blocks, then they better be processed or something's wrong, right? Or something like this. Um, you can imagine there's a bunch of kind of area to explore. Uh, but the general idea, what's cool about the framework is that uh, load balancing and also kind of the base structure doesn't change, and so we can actually essentially compose these different message passing schemes um, and have like different kind of asynchronous or maybe even synchronous sharding solutions all specified under one, one framework, which would be cool. But it's a pipe dream. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'll stop screen sharing. Uh, thanks for listening. Sorry, that was a... Uh... No, no, that's, it's very interesting. I, 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 I still think we can clean this up if we just start you know, acknowledging that the validators are you know, essentially processes. You know? <laughs> And the blocks are processes, and we can make this all really, really clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. Um, and I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to. I'd love to uh, clean it up. But hey, man, that's why I'm uh, you know learning about the process calculate, right? <laughs> cool. No, it's, it's very interesting work. I'm, I'm really. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I mean, I think as we get deeper into the cleanup, I'll, I'll be able to give more substantive commentary. Cool. Yeah. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Uh. Uh, did you have anything else? Any other updates? Um, uh, that should be it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening in again. Sweet. So I, I'm continuing to go down this path of uh, on the research side of looking at oh, um, this approach that I outlined last Monday on um, trying to uh, uh, on validating the transition function. Uh, so, so again, just just to let people understand what the problem is, the, the problem is we we have we we can expect that um, there's a proposal that we get from state P 
to state p prime through some uh, number of steps. And we want to know that the transitions uh, and the states uh, were all legal um, and that uh, without having to run the machine. So we want it to be more efficient than running just running the machine. Uh, this is an exceptionally hard problem. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not ex you know, I don't have any expectations that I can solve it. Uh, and certainly I don't have expectations to be being able to solve it um, by the time we ship Mercury. Um, but I am, I do have some strong intuitions. What are those intuitions? The intuitions are that um, uh, reduction um, should be continuous in the topological sense of continuous. In fact, effectively, reduction defines the notion of continuity um, for some space, and that space looks remarkably like a Scott domain. So we'll talk about what a Scott domain is in a minute. Um, and, but if we just use geometry, um, the thought is that uh, we, um, the places where you would have branching that would explode, um, the, which is what, what is the problem with verifying by running the machine, right? You, to verify by running the machine, you, 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 you have to, you, you potentially have to look at lots of different possible branchings. Sorry, um, so when, when you say branching, do you mean like a non-deterministic choice in which? Yeah, yeah, yeah non-deterministic choice. Basically, you have a race. In, 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 in our chain, it comes down to there's a race. The other place is that you have a, 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 a select statement. So either you have a, a race or you have a select statement. Um, and, uh, and, so, and those are the possible sources of branching. And so, um, you know, trying to either forward chain or backward chain, either way you do it, you're going to end up with lots and lots of, you get a combinatorial explosion uh, to, to verify. Um, and, but now, if we think about this in terms, uh, the, the branch points are like directions in a geometric space. And continuity is like big jumps, uh, or, or, or sorry, small jumps. Continuity is small jumps. Uh, discontinuity is big jumps. So what we're interested in is effectively bounded regions. So we forget the direction. We're not interested in the direction, and the direction is the choice. We're just interested in making sure that whatever the choice was, it kept us inside this ball. It kept us inside this volume. Um, and so uh, now the, the, the challenge to all of this is that um, the topologies arising from computations are not, um, they don't have good separation properties that we expect in with our geometric intuitions. So our geometric intuitions um, have uh, a, a, a sort of crisp characterization in terms of separation. Um, typically, a space is called T2 or sometimes called Hausdorff. If um, whenever you have two points, you can find re a region around um, uh, one and a region around the other, you know, so that, you know, the region around one doesn't include the other and the region around the other doesn't include the one, right? So that's T2 style separation. And typically, we don't have T2 style separation. We don't even have T1 style separation in the topologies that arise from uh, computation. Um, and, and so the question is, is there any way to recover this basic geometric uh, intuition so that we can do this kind of uh, gap analysis, uh, to, to, so to speak? Um, uh, so let me stop there and just make sure if, if that I just the core intuitions make sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the next step is how do I how do I come up with uh, such a topology and such a uh, such a measure? Enter Key Martin. So Key Martin is uh, a researcher who came out of I think it was Oxford. And went to the Naval Research Group, uh, and then I think now he's at the Perimeter Institute. So he's been working on domain theory and information theory for a long time now, um, a good 10, 15 years, and has had some really interesting insights 
into um, domain theory and, and information theory and how they're related. Just a tiny, tiny little bit of background. Um, uh, back in the early 1960s, um, Dana Strake, uh, sorry, um, I don't remember Strake, Christopher Strakey. Christopher Strakey was um, proposing to use the lambda calculus to model computation. But at the time, because of the existence of the fixed point combinator, people suspected that the lambda calculus was inconsistent. They didn't believe that you could just, you know, automatically compute a fixed point. Um, and that, 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 that smelled suspicious. And so they were worried that there was an inconsistency in the middle of the lambda calculus. Um, and so Dana Scott uh, took it upon himself to find a model for the lambda calculus. And what he did was he built a, a, a topological model for the lambda calculus, which allowed, which um, um, uh, bas basically uh, get, got rid of the suspicions of the inconsistency. Another way to view the inconsistency is, in, uh, or, or the, the potential, the possibility for inconsistency is uh, to un uh, understand that the lambda calculus requires that um, the domain of lambda terms be isomorphic to the set of functions from the domain of lambda terms to the domain of lambda terms. And that sounds incredibly suspicious, right? Um, because what you're saying is that somehow a set is equal to the power set of itself. And that, and, and there are strong cardinality arguments and intuitions that suggest that that should never be the case. Um, and so what uh, Scott realized was it wasn't all the functions. It was only the continuous functions um, that we were interested in in this function uh, space. Um, and, uh, and then he provided a notion of continuity. And when you whack down, you eliminate the, the non-continuous ones from that set, you can establish this isomorphism and, and match the cardinalities. So that's the, the basic background here. That's the context in which uh, Scott was working. So he starts with a post set um, and he builds a topology over the, over the post set. Um, uh, and, and you can reason about, uh, you can read about, you know, what, uh, what the Scott topology is over a particular partially ordered set. Um, but the, the, the important thing is that um, Key Martin takes this idea and comes up with a new idea um, for how to how to measure the content of a particular element in a Scott domain. And the reason this is important is because Scott information, which is basically derives from the topology on on these uh, Scott domains, um, is is it's not clear how it's related to other notions of information like Shannon information or entropy. Um, and so what Key Martin did was to um, reconcile or connect Scott information with Shannon information. And so this measure of the content of an element in a Scott domain is one of the ways that we can talk about the connection between Scott information uh, and Shannon information. But it turns out to have this other um, uh, side effect, which is what I was looking for, which is to give us a way to um, geometrize um, the, the transition function. So I'll just quickly screen share here what I'm talking about. All right, so there's a, there's a paper here, um, a technique for verifying measurements. This is by Key Martin and Prakash Penangadan. Prakash Penangadan is, you know, at McGill, he's one of the luminaries in computing. Um, and M Martin's idea is, so basically in this paper, he, he recalls all the definitions for Scott domains. I'm, I'm not going to go over that here because we have very, very limited time. Um, but I will go over um, uh, this one definition and then a couple of examples. 
So if you have a, a Scott, a couple of Scott domains, so you have D and E, then a map from D to E is going to measure the content of an element of the first domain in terms of the others. If whenever you have um, uh, X inside uh, a, an open region, right? So think of so think of this as like the geometric intuition is X is a point and U is a ball around the point, right? Then um, you can find a um, uh, an element in um, a, a, a ball around uh, a point in um, in E, which is the, the target of the measurement map, um, such that X is in um, the mu um, prime of E. And so that, that uh, sort of the mu E, uh, and where mu E is just the inverse of the measurement function on, on this E intersected with the downward closure of X. So the downward closure is basically just think about it as um, roughly equivalent all the things that are below X in in the post set. Um, that's a, that's a, a a rough idea of, of it. So we take this measurement function, we go back to the target domain, uh, I mean to the source domain from the measurement function. We intersect that with all the things that are below X, right? And we we've, we've got to um, uh, uh, and we've got to be able to prove that X is sitting inside that thing. Okay, that's the um, that's the 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 um, requirement that our our measurement map measures the content of X. It's 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 saying it's giving us a uh, a way in which um, we can insist that this map is capturing sort of the um, uh, 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 how do I say it. Um, a measure of the information content of the particular computational element. So in, in the setting that we're talking about here, the states, um, the X, the, the, what, what, are, what are the Ds and the Es uh, in this setting? Um, so here, the D is going to be um, uh, row calculus terms. And I have to give an information theoretic ordering on those terms. I have to give a Scott topology. So it turns out that you can give a fairly crisp one that corresponds to exactly what we're thinking about. Like, for example, when Kyle is writing the, um, the precondition um, uh, uh, stuff for the, um, uh, for the spatial checker. Um, uh, what that's built on is a, is a notion of subterm. And you can generalize this notion of subterm. Um, uh, so what you say is, if I remember that um, the uh, the row terms and and everything else like this all comes from a monad. So the monad generates the terms. Um, I can insist that the row the monad be uh, differentiable. So I can I can take the derivative of the type that's given by the monad and get a, a type that is a context, a type that has a hole punched in it. Um, and then I can, I can insist, uh, I can say that, that X is less than Y if I can find a K, which is one of these context things, such that Y is equal to K applied to X. So you can think about this as a generalized subterm relation. And then um, you, the maximal elements of this kind of relation would be structural recursions. For example, the bang operator in the pi calculus is such a structural recursion. Um, so, so now this gives us a notion of um, uh, ordering, and we can build a Scott topology uh, on this partial set. The ordering has to, it, you can think of this uh, when we're talking about row calculus terms, uh, basically a, you know, a state is a substate if it uh, collects more information. Right. So if it if it uh, if it if it has elaborated more blocks and the, that are represented in the in the row term, um, that that's the, so you can think of adding more terms as adding history. Uh, that's that's a rough rough intuition. Um, and and now um, we can build a map 
um, over to some other uh, domain. Now, in this case, uh, as, as Key Martin shows, you can build maps into the interval domain. So this is a, a domain of, of, uh, of real intervals. Um, and it turns out that, um, uh, and again, this, uh, we, we have a very, very short amount of time here, uh, and there's a lot of math to get through. But it, it turns out that you can recover the topology on the um, uh, interval domain, which is your standard geometric topology from a measurement map that measures um, a Shannon style channel capacity. Um, so, uh, so we get the usual Hausdorff kind of distances from a map that doesn't even satisfy the triangle equality. Now this is huge, right? Because, because it means I can go get the geometric style separation um, that I want without having um, this, this, uh, uh, the, the triangle inequality, which is, uh, how do I say this? Effectively, I, 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 I'm going to be able to build regions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be able to characterize continuity in terms of, that, that's in a, in a way that's very, very close to our geometric uh, intuition without having this T2 uh, style separation, right? So, so that's, the, that's the, the basic idea is that um, using this definition, I build a map from uh, a Scott domain that I build over uh, row calculus terms that are ordered in this subterm relation or generalized subterm relation, um, which allows me to use uh, term accretion as the, as the accumulation of history. Um, and then I build a map from that into the inter interval domain in order to um, uh, detect when um, a transition is uh, um, uh, not continuous. That's that's the trick. It it will it will not and it will not be continuous if it makes a big jump outside of a region. Um, and, and this definition that's on the screen here is what enables me to, to characterize um, those, those kinds of big jumps. Um, what remains to be shown is whether or not the computations that that entails are any more efficient. Like it could be that hiding inside that computation, I've still got, you know, some ridiculously uh, complex uh, calculation, right? That, that you know, like, you know, I, I need to like compute the zeros of the zeta function or something. Some some ungodly computation that's that's that has made no progress in in terms of you know what we're trying to do is it's still just as computationally hard. But at least what I have been able to do is to connect all the dots. Here's the intuition, um, and here's the set of definitions. That allow me to go to uh, you know over to uh, um, what looks much more like a geometric calculation to verify the the, the transition, and then uh, and, and then the, the next step is to um, is to look at uh, whether or not uh, that uh, pseudo or semi geometric calculation is any better than just running the machine. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I know it's a lot of a lot of machinery. Um, yeah, definitely got definitely got an intuition. That was super cool. Thanks. Um, I guess my question is, why do you have an intuition that um, that it would be more efficient in the first place? Because we're erasing direction. So, so the the the, the, what, the geometry basically says I don't care about the branching. Just stay inside this region. I see. I so you you don't have to say it, the computation this took this specific path, right? Or something. I, I, I erase I erase all the information about all the different paths. I just say stay inside this bubble. As long as you're inside this bubble, we're all good. <laughs> yeah, it sounds easier. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> I anyway, that's, this is really cool, and uh, 
I think it relates, you know, if, if we think of it as uh, what we call information theory was really Sh Shannon's theory of communication, and he introduced a continuum of probabilities. Uh, whereas within a Scott topology, we have uh, a finite space. Uh, we our possibilities are infinite, effectively, still, but we are, as we say, inside a bubble. We're we're finite. Well, it's not, it's not really finite, right? The, the, I mean, this, 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 the, the maximal well, elements of the Scott domain are, are fixed points, right? So, right. It, well, it's, it's bounded uh, in a sense. It, well, you've, you've got some notion of compactness. That, that's what's really going on. The compact elements are the, are the things. I've got to jump over to the, um, uh, the, the dev stand up. Oh, no, I guess that's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, Greg, uh, if, if I can just catch your, uh, catch like two minutes with you. Well, it'll be cool too if you have the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jim, let's let's pick this up next week. I think this is a really interesting. Uh, uh, and I, I I strongly recommend everyone read Key Martin's papers. They're really entertaining as well as uh, very insightful. Do you want to drop them in the uh, Casper Discord, Greg? Yeah. I'm sorry. If you just change the word probability to possibility. In Shannon's original paper, I think you have an information theory uh, with Scott apologies. Okay, I have to contemplate that. <laughs> That's an interesting one. <laughs> awesome. And it also made if you if you want to drop uh, what you presented in in there as well in the Discord, that'd be cool too. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Thanks. I, I can do that. Okay. Very okay. good, Christian. I can. Uh, do you want to? Oh, we can, I can just, we can stay on this channel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me end the call. Thanks everyone. See you Thanks. Next week. Thanks so much. Super interesting.